Hello, Hello. sisters. Welcome once again to episode Welcome. 105, mm -hmm. season four. We just thank God we're able to come before you yes. once again, once again. So this week we're we're going to switch our focus a little bit. We've been focusing on God for the past <laughs> few Saturdays. Mm -hmm. God is always in the midst, though, so we're not going to definitely not eliminate God. We're just going to focus on life. But last week uh, we focused on on God, and we talked about. Uh, during this Black History Portrait Month, we talked about the uh, civil rights grandmother mm -hmm. of the movement. Yes. And that was uh, African-American educator and civil rights activist by the name of Septima, or Septima, I'm not sure <laughs> what's right. the right pronunciation, right. Uh, Pornset Clark, mm -hmm. who developed the literacy and the citizenship workshops Bad sister. Yeah, that played an important role in the drive for voting rights right. and civil rights for the African Americans in the mm -hmm. civil rights movement. Yes. We also discovered that she's the uh, grandmother of our homeboys, Nira and Eli Clark in Hickory, mm -hmm. North Carolina. So that was a good show. We really enjoyed uh, her and talking yes. about her. But also, uh, she claimed knowledge could empower marginalized groups mm -hmm. in ways that formal legal equality couldn't. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to switch to, like I mentioned earlier, on life. And yes. as we focus on life, we're going to continue with Black History Tributes. Uh -huh. And today our topic is African American first. Yes. African American first. And our subtopic is Black Originals in different categories from business, politics, sports, mm -hmm. and everything in between <laughs> that have been have not been recognized or highlighted in Black history moments by the mainstream media. Exactly. So we're going to bring them to you today, especially since we have the first two Black quarterbacks that's getting ready to play in the Super Bowl on tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about that. Yes, and before we get started, we want to definitely give honor and uh, tribute to our fellow podcasters here on BS3 po uh, Network. Yes, I'm yes. sorry, <laughs> getting a little tongue tied, but yeah, we want to definitely uh, give kudos to all of them. Uh, we're in the double digits, well, uh, in the 40s, right? Maybe right, even right. the 50s, and a special <laughs> shout out also to our fearless leader yes, uh, yes, that works yes. tirelessly, uh, bringing that spirit of excellence mm -hmm. uh, for us to, to emulate. Right, And right, right. Uh, he is Ben Sutter III, BS3, uh, that makes up this network. Right. Um, and and uh, he's also referred to as Mr. F Podfather. Podfather, right. And right. Mr. Podcaster, Podcaster himself. himself. That's right who offers coaching if you happen to be interested. He does offer coaching for those that want to get started in podcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, reach out to him. He is there, willing and able, certainly capable of helping you to get your feet wet in this arena. Right. And also, right. if you have not downloaded BS3 Network on your Christmas Roku devices, <laughs> <laughs> I know you're still enjoying them, but oh, you know, yeah. you can't enjoy them without this BS3 <laughs> network. There is a That's link it. on your screen. We invite you to check out all of this content that is available mm -hmm. for your listening and your viewing pleasure. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. without further ado, we do we have, just. I'm sorry, we That's definitely right. <laughs> want you to reach out to us at Cesarus. Uh, podcast. That's mm -hmm. our email address on your screen. Yeah, um, yes, and yes. we definitely like to recognize uh, Brian D. Williams. Thank oh, yeah. you for Thank joining. You. Good, good afternoon. Looking yeah, forward to afternoon. being with you next week. Yes. yes, um, yes. And so, without further ado, we want to definitely uh, show you a little bit of what's going on at BS3 Network, and we'll be right back. BS3 Network, changing the way you watch TV.
So as we continue with our Black History Month tributes, mm -hmm. we got some African American first. Now the first category we're going to start out with is real estate or land ownership. Now this category is very near and dear to my heart because I was uh, in the secular world as a mortgage loan officer and also a sales manager. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time of my business career in the mortgage industry. So this particular category was very interesting to me. And we're going to bring to you today a brother by the name of Anthony Johnson. Mm -hmm. Anthony Johnson was the first Black prominent landholder in the English colonies. Johnson arrived in Virginia in 1621 aboard the James ship. So it is uncertain if Johnson arrived as an indentured servant or as a slave but early records list him as Antonio, a Negro. Mm. <laughs> That's what they called him, Antonio, a Negro. So regardless of his status, wow. Johnson was bound labor and was put to work on Edward Bennett's plantation, which is the tobacco plantation near, uh, I'm trying to pronounce this uh, Native American word for you, Juarez Kaki, Virginia. Now in March of 1622, local Tidewater Indians attacked the Bennett's plantation, killing 52 people. Mm. The Native Americans were, were probably defending their territory. So Johnson was one of only five on the plantation who survived the attack. Mm -hmm. In 1622, Mary, a Negro woman, as she was also described, mm -hmm. arrived aboard the Margaret and John ship. And like Anthony, she ended up on the Bennett's plantation. Wow. So at the same point, Anthony and Mary, some point they were married. And in 1653, Northampton County Court documents list Mary as Anthony's wife. Mm. So it was a prosperous and enduring union that lasted over 40 years and produced at least four children, uh, two sons and two daughters. The couple was respected in their community for their hard labor and known service according to the court documents. Similar to us, we've been married for 40 plus years, right. still counting, we have four children, mm -hmm. uh, one son, BS3, and three daughters, Anastasia, who's now deceased, Camelia, and Deidre. So we've been blessed, thank you Lord. We've been yes. blessed by God with the opportunity to serve his people with love and longevity. So at some point between 1625 and 1640, Anthony and Mary gained their freedom mm. and they moved to Virginia Eastern Shores where they purchased a modest estate. They began raising cattle and hogs. And by 1651, Johnson claimed 250 acres of land along the Pugatig Creek. Are you hearing me? 1651, mm. they acquired or claimed 250 acres. Wow. He claimed the land virtue of five head rights. Now, head rights mean a grant of land, usually 50 acres to settlers, mm -hmm. given by certain colonies, companies in 17th and 18th century. The one of which was the name of his son, Richard Johnson. It is impossible to know if Anthony imported the other men whose names appeared on the head right land claims but it was possible that he did. It is also possible that he purchased head right certificates from other planters. Either way, 250 acres was a sizable plantation by standards of that day. By 1654, Johnson, two sons, Richard and John, both own acreage adjoining their father's land, which bring me to my first scripture, 67, Psalm 67, six and seven. It says, Psalm 67, six to seven, it says, then shall the earth yield her increase mm. and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. So in addition to being a landowner, Anthony Johnson also, y'all ready for this? <laughs> also was a slaveholder. Wow. Now, course records reveal that Johnson won a 1655 case against white planter Robert Parker, mm. who retained ownership of Johnson's slave, John Kazar. 
Now, Kazar, with the help of Robert Parker, tried to claim that he was an indentured servant, not a slave. Although the courts initially found Parker's favor temporarily freeing Kazar, mm -hmm. they subsequently reversed the decision, returning Kazar to the service of his master, Anthony Johnson. Wow. Just like today, you have black folks taking advantage of, mm -hmm. misusing, and abusing, and even killing other black folks. Sad. 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 But he was a slaveholder. He was a plantation owner, the mm. first as an African-American man. So a fire in 1653, years after claiming the land, destroyed much of Johnson's plantation. As a result of the fire, Anthony and Mary petitioned the court for tax relief, which was granted on the grounds that they would have difficulties obtaining a livelihood. Mm. So it's interesting. It's interesting to me how a black man, who own his businesses, mm. properties, and, and towns mysteriously burned down all the time back then. Wow. Kind of mysterious how this actually happened. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's impressive to me that Johnson, a black man, won two court cases <laughs> in the 1600s. Right. So sometime in the 1660s, Anthony and Mary Johnson, their dependent children, their married sons, John and Richard, all moved north to Maryland. And in Maryland, Anthony leased 300 acres from Tony's Vineyard, where he lived until his death in 1670. Wow. Mary survived her husband, and in her 1672 will, she bequitted a cow to each of her grandsons. Now, back oh, then, yeah. that, was, that was expensive <laughs> property now. You had cattle, you got wow, some beef. Wow, what a gift. Yeah, what a gift to each of her grandsons. <laughs> okay. And Anthony, Mary's grandson, John Jr. purchased 44 acres of farm, mm. which he named Angola, where John Jr. later died without leaving an heir. And by 1730, the Johnson family had vanished from the historical records, vanished oh. from the historical records, mm. which was probably intentional. Exactly. Because they probably took everything they, that they right. had. Because white people didn't want the historical facts to be taught. Yeah. to other Blacks who were inspired other Blacks to become landowners. So they wiped it away from all historical records, which gives me my last yeah. scripture, which is Job 121. Job 121, he said, Naked I came out of my mother's mm -hmm. womb, and naked I should return thither. Said the Lord gave, and the Lord taketh take it away. away. Bless it. it be the name of the Lord. Wow. All right, Anthony. <laughs> you had all that land. Yeah, well, I yeah. want you guys to meet mm. Constance Baker Motley. Now, she is known for a multiple first. Right. She's a bad sister. One of the three <laughs> bad sisters that I'm going to highlight today. All right. Now, she was born in New Haven, Connecticut mm -hmm. in September of 1921 as mm -hmm. the ninth child. Wow of a family of 12 and they were immigrants of the West Indies. Mm -hmm. So Motley grew up attending integrated schools in New Haven right. uh, where she became an avid reader. She mm. was so inspired about uh, heroes of civil rights movement, even at the age of 15, wow. that she made up in her mind that she was going to be an attorney and mm -hmm. that she did. So this reminds me of the scripture, you know, and we speak this scripture over our lives in so many ways and so mm -hmm. many times. Psalms 37 verse four, and it reads, delight thyself also in the Lord yes, and yes. he shall, shall give thee the desires awesome. of thine heart. Yes, so yes, in this yes. day and time, most black families, you know, their economic situation was not the greatest. Right, right. And so um, with their sacrifices and hard work, uh, you know, they are such role models for us. If we could get back to the mm -hmm. sacrifice, mm -hmm. the hard work, right. the savings, mm -hmm. the, you know, the doing without, right. we can do without some things. We, we feel like we got to have everything, the latest and the greatest. <laughs> and so since Constance, you know, since she could not attend college immediately mm. okay. after graduating college, I'm sorry, high school. Um, she found a job with the National Youth Administration. Hmm. 
and she understood that she had to do what she had to do right, right. to get to where she wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so God has always and will always be in the blessing business. Yes, so yes. while Constance um, Motley was mm -hmm. given a speech mm -hmm. at a local community center one night, mm -hmm. You know, I won't say lo and behold, but God placed a wealthy, a right. wealthy white contractor okay. in the midst, in the audience that was so impressed mm -hmm. that he offered to pay for her college. Wow. Look at God. Mm -hmm. Won't he do it? <laughs> so in 1941, she began to attend uh, her college career at Fisk University <laughs> in Nashville, Tennessee. All right. Uh, later on in life, I could probably understand in 43, <laughs> baby girl had to make a transfer mm -hmm. to New York University where she received her bachelor's degree in economics. Okay. So in 1944, she became the first black woman to be accepted into Columbia mm. Law School wow. where she met the incomparable Thurgood Marshall. Mm. Okay. who was the chief counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Mm. So in 46, she received a degree while she worked for the Legal Defense Fund. Okay. And in that same year, she married a real estate broker, okay. Joel Wilson Motley Jr. Mm -hmm. And to that marriage was born Joel Wilson Motley III, All right. who is now the co-chair of Human Rights Watch. Mm -hmm. Look the brother up. He's doing some things. <laughs> right. So during her career with the NAACP, Constance uh, Motley was involved with many high pro profile cases. Okay. So she played a major role in the uh, legal preparation for the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education. Wow. And she was the first black woman to argue a case mm. before the United States Supreme Court. Mm, mm. She was doing it. Now, she was also the lead counsel mm -hmm. in the case that allowed uh, James Meredith to gain admission to the University of Mississippi mm -hmm. in 1962. Now, we mm -hmm. were young then, what, three? <laughs> Two, three years old. Yeah. Now. So yeah. besides fighting the rights of Blacks to get into segregated schools, mm -hmm. Motley also defended protesters mm -hmm. that were being arrested during the Freedom, freedom Rights uh, yeah. rides, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, of the early 1960s. Okay. And she won nine out of the 10 cases wow. argued before the Supreme Court between 61 mm -hmm. and 1963. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in 64, another first, Motley entered politics and she was the first woman to be elected to, to the New York Senate, mm -hmm. uh, New York State Senate, that is, in mm -hmm. 1964. And in 1965, she became the first woman to hold a position of the Manhattan borough mm. president wow i mean this woman mm. and then president lyndon b johnson mm. appointed her to the united states district court in 1966 making her the first mm. african-american woman to hold a federal judgeship wow. Wow. so judge constance baker motley died mm. in september of 2005 at the age of 84 mm. And over the course of her long career in law and politics, mm -hmm. she received over 70 awards and eight honorary degrees from various universities. Wow. wow. That was Constance Baker Motley. Wow. Bad sister there. Multiple firsts. <laughs> multiple firsts. So I believe this is uh, CJ Boy. CJ, I had to go and look you up. You got to let us know. Click that that link. Yeah, good but evening. good evening good to evening. you. Good evening. And he also says, oh, wow, I did not know Ben was the only son both of you have. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to mess with you about that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, he's the best son ever. <laughs> and, of course, he's watching. Good Thank afternoon. you, Trey. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Good Thank afternoon. you for tuning in, everyone. All right. All right. So our next category, we're going to go to business. Mm -hmm. Now, in this category, we're going to talk about automobile manufacturing companies. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you know, we men, we we love our fine, nice Cars. vehicles, sunroof top, diamond in the back, digging in the scene with the gangster Lee. You know, we we love mm -hmm. our nice vehicles. So <laughs> C.R. Patterson and Sons Company was a carriage building firm. The wow. first 
African-American owned automobile manufacturer. Mm -hmm. The company was founded by Charles Richard Patterson or C.R. Patterson, mm -hmm. who was born in slavery, April 1833. Great birth month. April's <laughs> coming up. I'm telling you, great birth month. I can of promise you that. Of course. On a plantation in Virginia. Okay. So now we're learning a lot that a lot of intelligent and creative people uh, and courageous African Americans yes. were born or either enslaved in Virginia. Mm. His parents was Nancy and Charles Patterson. Now, Patterson escaped from slavery in 1861 during the Underground Railroad just wow. before the Civil War. He headed west and settled in Greenville, Ohio around mm. 1862. Now at some point after his arrival in Ohio, mm -hmm. Patterson went to work as a blacksmith for a carriage building business, mm. Dines and Simpson, mm -hmm. which were all horse-drawn carriages. Now he bought into the blacksmith business, mm. took it over, and founded C.P. Patterson Carriage Company, mm. which built various horse-drawn vehicles beginning in 1860s. Now, in 1865, he married Josephine Utz and had five children from 1866 to 1879. In 1873, mm. Patterson went in partnership with J.P. Lowe, another Greenfield-based carriage manufacturer. Over the next 20 years, Patterson and Lowe developed highly sophisticated and successful business carriages and also different devices. But in 1893, Patterson bought out J.P. Lowe's share of the business and he reorganized it as C.R. Patterson's and Sons Company. C.R. Patterson, he was smart, savvy businessman. Mm. And the company built 28 types of horse-drawn vehicles and employed approximately 10 to 15 individuals. Mm. While the company managed successfully, market is, is inquan powered. Now that means he's a horse, mule, or donkey, carriages, and buggies. Mm -hmm. The dawn of the automobile was rapidly approaching. So Charles Patterson, he died in 1910, leaving a successful carriage business to his son, Frederick, who in turn initiated the conversion of the company from a carriage business into an automobile manufacturer. That's always the case, right? Mm. You know, the younger generation, they, they take creativity to the next level. To the next to level. To the next level. That's so his son right. got within the, the ingenuity of automobile manufacturing, which was something that was coming of that age mm. because of creativity and because of the ingenuity and because things was moving forward. Things was moving on. Mm. So the first Patterson Greenfield car debuted in 1915 wow and was sold for 850 dollars now that's 850 dollars is equivalent to twenty nine thousand dollars today mm -hmm. with a four cylinder continental engine the car was comparable to the contemporary t model four wow. but the patterson greenville car was actually built before ford's t model and may, in fact, have been more sophisticated <laughs> than the Ford's car. But C.R. Patterson and Son never matched the Ford's manufacturing capability. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. See, as black people, we're always, you know, we love our fancy cars yeah. and trucks. But see, not having the financial and the corporate backing in a Pacific industry is key. Yeah. So when it comes to having success, and longevity in a small business venture. So, so we never get the credit that we deserve for being the first. Right. So yes, he was the first automobile manufacturer, African-American manufacturer. But not only that, mm. history did not share with us that his car was the first manufactured vehicle. Oh, you hear about that T-Model 4. T-Model 4. I hear about T-Model 4. That's it. So estimates of Patterson Greenfield car production vary. But it is almost certain that no more than 150 vehicles were built. That's a lot of vehicles when you consider the era yeah. that they were built in. So we got to give them his props, give them his kudos. Wow. And the company soon switched to production of trucks, buses, 
and other utility vehicle bodies, mm. which were installed atop chassis made by major automobile manufacturers, such as Ford mm -hmm. and General Motors. Mm. So its school bus bodies in particular became popular in Midwestern school districts, which began to convert from horse drawn to internal bustions fire transportation by the 1920, or combustion, excuse me, fire transportation by 1920. So what do they do? They put their emphasis on vehicles transporting cargo and children to expand their business opportunity, being creative to maximize their potential for business growth. So they understood that they were they couldn't compete mm -hmm. with Ford and General Motors when it came to automobiles. So they converted over to transporting cargo with trucks and children <laughs> with buses. I'm telling you, smart brother. I tell Look. you, the young guys are very creative Savvy. and innovative. Yes, That's yes. Right. So around 1920, the company was re re reorganized as the Greenfield Bus Body Company. Mm -hmm. But after 10 years of steady success, it funds speculation of growth. Great Depression sent the company into a downward spiral. Oh. And Frederick Patterson died in 1932. And the company began to de disintegrate in the late 1930s or disintegrate in the late 1930s. And around 1938, the company moved to Calapias, Ohio, changing its name again to Gallia Body Company in an attempt to restart the prior success. Mm -hmm. But the attempt failed. And the company permanently closed its doors in 1939. Mm. Like many other small automobile manufacturers, the mm -hmm. company was unable to compete with Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, and other large automobile manufacturers. But no Patterson Greenfield automobile are known to have survived to the present. But some C.R. Patterson and Son carriages and buggies are still in extant which is sad. Mm. It's sad that not one single automobile was preserved for historical purposes, mm. which was probably intentional. Just like the, the historical land ownership was intentional that we didn't hear about that mm -hmm. or, the, or the individuals in that era didn't hear about it. Right. They did not preserve not one of his vehicles, mm. which would be an inspiration mm -hmm. to those mm -hmm. who wanted to follow behind him. Mm -hmm. Let me close with this scripture. Psalm 67 and 1, it says, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Yes. It's okay, though. It's it's not erasable. Right, you know, right, they right. may think it is, but it's going to be those of us mm -hmm. like this particular episode that's going to highlight and we're going to keep sharing and, and emphasizing on our history. Right. So now I want you to meet Melody Hobson. Mm -hmm. She is one of our featured current day okay. women in black history. Mm -hmm. Now Melody is the co-CEO, president and chairman of the board mm -hmm. of Ariel Investments, okay. which was founded by brother, <laughs> brother man, John W. Rogers Jr. Right. Who, by the way, is the co-CEO and the CIO, brother, know the numbers, <laughs> chief investment officer. In mm. 2020, Melody was named Starbucks. That's, that's my weakness. There you, there you go. <laughs> Starbucks Bucks first black chairwoman of wow. the board. Wow. I'm going to have to get in her ear because <laughs> she's going to have to reduce some of these prices on these coffee. But she was raised by a single mother. Uh -huh. And she recalls how frequently they moved and how there was always drama. Mm. Now, mm. look, there, there's no excuse when people can endure. Mm. This is an example of endurance. Now, her mother also couldn't pay the bills. Wow. Their electricity would be cut off mm. and they wouldn't have, you know, hot water for, for their baths. Mm -hmm. But they also had their phone cut off a lot of times. You know, a lot of us can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they were even, you know, evicted a few times, a car repossessed. She went oh. through a lot, mm. but it wasn't as bad as some had it, she mm. said. And so she tried not to make too much of it, to mm. be honest. 
And she had a, she realized she had a loving family. And Mm -hmm. although her mother, you know, often came up short financially, she realized and appreciated that her mother did the best that she could. Mm -hmm. And that's the instance in most cases. I mean, they did the best with what they had, Mm -hmm. but out of the embarrassment, Melody, you know, was embarrassed with her living conditions that she just would not invite any friends over to her house. Mm -hmm. And so she struggled in the first grade too. Um, Mm -hmm. She was placed in a remedial class. Mm -hmm. Are we surprised about that? Mm -hmm. You know, they call it remedial, special ed, whatever you want to call it, (laughs) uh, to, to, you know, kind of dumb us down some. Mm -hmm. But viewing education as the great equalizer, Melody created a vision of how she wanted her life to be. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the case? When people go through hard times as, as a child, Oh, they come out of that oh, and yeah. succeed That's and right. surpass. So she decided right away that she didn't want to be the child that couldn't keep up. Mm-hmm. And so she said, "That's why I became obsessed with my grades and self improvement." Wow. You're talking about determination. So she fell in love with children's books in the library that mm-hmm. were, you know, biographies of famous people, and she vowed to read all of those books by the end of the sixth grade. Wow. She challenged herself to know the names of all the Ivy League schools. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure her teachers were like, you don't need to know that. Girl, (laughs) go sit down somewhere. But she told her mother Mm -hmm. that she was going to go to Yale. Mm -hmm. And she put a sign up on her mirror in her bedroom Mm -hmm. that said A plus. Mm -hmm. Look, we can instill that into our children to just look, write the vision, Mm -hmm. write the vision. So looking back, she said school structured uh, her and gave her security. Okay. Because it was the one place that she said mm-hmm. in her life that was not chaotic. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to bring up this scripture for you. It's Romans mm-hmm. uh, chapter four, verse 17. And that's the B clause. And it says, call it those things which be not wow. as though they were. Yes. yes now she yes. spoke it. Mm-hmm. And she believed it. All right, all right. Now there is power in words. I'm sure you know that. Mm-hmm. If you can speak it, God can can perform it and bring it to pass. Yes. There's power and blessings right, right. when we speak the word over our lives. So mm-hmm. she went on to excel by leaps and bounds. Mm-hmm. She was working at 15 at these high end stores mm-hmm. where people had to call to make an appointment to buy some items. You know, these were some folk with some money. (laughs) She attended Princeton University in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And she really thought, oh, this is nice. (laughs) She attended Princeton's uh, Woodrow Wilson School of International Relations and Public Policy. She interned with Ariel Investments, where she is now, as I said, the co-CEO and the president and chairman of the board. Mm Mm-hmm. And she actually said back in the day when she interned that this is going to be a permanent employment mm-hmm. for me. Right. She she right. knew that even before she even got the job. Mm-hmm. And then she earned her bachelor's degree in 1991. And of course, she became the first member of her family okay. to graduate from college. Right. She has successfully accomplished so much. So in October 8th, 2020, mm-hmm. Melody Hobson and the Hobson Lucas family. Yes, she is married to George Lucas. I'll get to that in a minute. (laughs) Made the lead and substantial gift to establish Mm -hmm. a new residential college, a college now at Princeton University. It will be named after her Mm -hmm. as the Hobson College. Okay, And so thus, that will be the first residential college Mm -hmm. at Princeton that's named after a black woman. Mm -hmm. Look at that. (laughs) So in June of 2022, uh, Hobson joined Walton Penner Group. (coughs) Mm -hmm. And that consists of S. Robeson Walton, who is Sam Walton, who is the owner of Walmart, your favorite store. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Greg Penner, Uh who is Sam Walton's granddaughter's husband. Okay. Carrie Walton Penner, who is Sam Walton's granddaughter. Uh, Condoleezza Rice. Y'all remember the the sister girl, Condoleezza? 
that worked with Curious George, uh, the president, <laughs> but anyway, Condoleezza Rice, mm -hmm. Sir Lewis Hamilton, that's a race car driver, interesting, mm -hmm. and they all purchased the Denver Broncos. Wow. wow. That deal was complete mm. in August of 2022. Okay, okay. So this makes the Walton Penner Group, mm -hmm. who, uh, as I mentioned, is a part of the Sam Walton and the Walmart family. Right, right. But that right. makes Melody the first Black woman to have equity mm -hmm. in an NFL team. Wow. Namely, the Denver Broncos. Mm, okay. Have you okay. ever heard of that? <laughs> you see how they nestled that into this Penner group right, right, and right. don't really mention anybody's name. This is mm. the Walton Penner group. Okay. But sister girls right, right, are right. in that in group. The, in that group. Owners, right. Look at that. So mm. here's a quote from her uh, about her being a part of this aerial investment. Mm. Uh, it's not from her, but it's from the people that actually associated with this okay. group. Okay. So beyond her role at Aerial Investments, mm. Melody is an influential leader in corporate and civic organizations mm. across the nation. Wow. Wow. And so they're saying that uh, her new position puts her in a place to open the door for more. Mm. We haven't seen it yet, mm -hmm. but more black ownership opportunities in the NFL. There you go. There and you she go. says that, look, uh, football isn't just a boy's club. Okay. So I'm waiting <laughs> for them to open the door up. Look, Don't people have been knocking at right, the door right, right. and they have not been allowed in. So, mm -hmm. you know, whoever's listening, let, <laughs> let us in because we got some money too. Mm -hmm. We might have to cluster up with a bunch of us <laughs> and make right. it happen. Right. But we got we got we'll money too. That's right. So in 2017, we'll Hobson was named the head of the Economic Club of Chicago, mm -hmm. the first African-American woman to do so. Mm -hmm. So to venture off a little bit, as I said before, 2013, Melody married George Lucas. Okay. The well-known film mm -hmm. director, right, right, right. producer, screenwriter, mm -hmm. and entrepreneur, mm -hmm. a wealthy white man right, right, who right. is said to be worth $5.4 billion. billion dollars. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. she's 53, okay. and he's 78. <laughs> wow. I just say he 80. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, and now, our first 58-year-old mm -hmm. Black female vice president Right, right. Kamala Harris right. is married to an attorney, Doug Emhoff, mm -hmm. and they are worth mm. $5 million. Okay. Now, they're the same age, okay. 58. Okay. And then our first 52-year-old Black female Supreme Court Justice, right. All right. Katanji Brown yeah. Jackson, All right. All right. who is married to the Chief of Division mm -hmm. of General Surgery, <laughs> And surgeon himself, Patrick mm -hmm. Graves Jackson. Okay. He got a black name. Look at that. <laughs> and they are worth seven million. Okay. okay. Now you notice how Harris and Hobson they mm -hmm. retain their maiden name. Now isn't that interesting? How you see that a lot, mm -hmm. and it, it makes me wonder. You know, I can understand. Look, I'm not mad at it. Retain your heritage, right. your right. family, you know, mm -hmm. name, your upbringing. Uh, but it's obviously done, mm -hmm. you know, on two different spectrums. Mm -hmm. One is to protect their association, right, I right. feel, against, you know, I'm sorry, amongst certain people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their people. Right, and, of right. course, it's clearly evidence so that they can associate with their white cronies right. through their white husbands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, are they selling out? That's my question. <laughs> to climb the ladder? Right. Of right. success, mm. you know, is this Good really question. based on love? Good question. <laughs> or, you know, is this co connection of, of obviously it's affording them the right. status, right. the right. clout, right. the right. business opportunity uh, mm. that they desire, mm. probably from you know their childhood. Right, right. Now with Hobson, along with other people in their upbringing, you know, she probably felt, look, I deserve this, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm gonna go after it. Just mm -hmm. like some of these NBA players, NBA right. player, right. NFL, NFL players, you know, yeah. Yeah. that make the millions that never had it. Mm -hmm. I'm not, it, look, it's nothing wrong with it, but it's just like, you know, how they obtain it and how they go about it. Right. Now, pardon mm -hmm. my Ebonics, mm -hmm. but I know when I look at some <laughs> these three white men, <laughs> <laughs> looks ain't everything. Right, right, right. But money ain't either. Right. <laughs> it don't bring you happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes you look good. 
But, you know, if they like it, I love it. Mm -hmm. But let's be clear. Mm -hmm. I love the skin I'm in. Mm -hmm. And I love this fine man mm -hmm. right here. <laughs> this African-American brother mm -hmm. with his fine self. Look, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not judging, you know, to each his own. But, you know, I just had to bring out my point of view on that. Mm -hmm. uh, on that situation, but Melody Hobson mm. is a black is a bad black sister. Yes, I gotta yes, give her her props, regardless of <laughs> right. who she, well, married she married to. Right. <laughs> she she did that. Right. She did that. Right. right. And God has blessed her. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. All right. All right. So that's interesting. You know, you bring up a good point. Mm. You know, uh, is it about career advancement or is it really yeah, about love? Me. You know, so you. When you look at some of the firsts and you look at uh, who they sleeping with, it's kind of okay. Makes you want to say, hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it goes, it comes with the territory. Right. Well, now we're going to switch to another category, which is medicine. Mm -hmm. Now, which is always interesting because we all need to, to have some medicine or be medicated or go to the hospital <laughs> or something, especially right. when you get our age. Right. Yeah, you're going to need some medicine and you're going to need some treatments or oh, some type ailments. of ailments. Yeah, something's going to happen. But I want to talk about the first black owned hospital. Okay. Daniel Hale Williams III. Mm. He was a pioneer surgeon. Yes. Best known for performing in 1893, one of the world's first successful open heart, heart surgeries. Surgery. Yes. Williams was born January 18, 1856, mm -hmm. in Hollandaysburg, Pennsylvania, to Sarah Price Williams and Daniel Hale Williams II. Mm. Now, following the death of his father, Williams lived with family, friends in Baltimore, Maryland, mm. and with family in Illinois from 1866 to 1878. So from 10-year-old to 22-year-old, mm. he was living with family and friends, mm -hmm. where he was a shoemaker, apprentice, and barber until he decided to pursue his education. Wow. 1878. Williams' interest in medicine began when he worked in the office of Henry Palmer, a Wisconsin surgeon. Mm. And in 1880, he enrolled in Chicago Medical College, receiving a doctorate of medicine degree three years later. Mm. Immediately after graduation, Williams opened his own practice in Chicago mm. and taught anatomy at Chicago Medical College. Mm. He became a trailblazer, setting high standards in in medical procedures and sanitary conditions, including adopting recently discovered sterilization procedures mm. in regard to germ transmission and prevention, which is also key even today to keep us from transmitting certain diseases or, right. or viruses when we were coming through the pandemic because of the coronavirus. They always mm. implicated sterilizing mm. items and mm. make sure you wash your hands correctly all of this was was mainly something that he he pioneered back in the late 1800s because if you ever look at 1800 photos mm. them folks didn't know nothing about <laughs> <laughs> being sanitary being clean being clean All being right. clean little brother said now nah, we got to clean some stuff up around okay. him he also wow. avoided the common practice of black doctors being barred from staff privileges in white hospitals by starting his own hospital. Mm. So in 1891, Williams co-founded Provident Hospital and Training School Association in a three-story building on Chicago's South Side. At the time, when only 909 Black physicians served 7.5 million African-American patients. So Providence, was the first black controlled hospital in the nation. Mm. Yet Providence was also the first medical facility mm. to have an interracial staff and the first training facility for African-American nurses in the United States. Wow. And during Williams tenure as physician, mm -hmm. he was also very prominent, not only in designing certain medical techniques, but he also was prominent in promoting education mm -hmm. for black nurses and, and black doctors. And he went over and above when it came to supporting his people. Because back then, it was very, very rare that blacks had an opportunity to advance in any type of medical facility, yeah. or any type of care 
when it came to medicine. But he was a pioneer when it came to helping out his people. Mm. He also, not only did he do that, but he, in his tenure, an owner of 1891 to 1912, 21 years, mm -hmm. Providence Hospital, Hospital grew, largely due to extremely high success in patient recovery. He had an 87% patient recovery percentage. Wow. Probably because he, he took pride in caring for his own people uh -huh. and gave them exceptional care. I mean, the best care available, that's what he gave. Mm -hmm. Unlike even today when we are discriminated against mm -hmm. and receive inferior care and treatment and services, even being used as guinea pigs, yeah. in some cases like the Tuskegee uh, study of untreated syphilis in black males between 1932 and 1972 and black patients that are missing out on potential life-saving cancer treatments in the clinical trials. Mm. But I'm going to give you this example. My wife has had two knee surgeries. She had one when she was in California. Mm -hmm. And it was by an Asian doctor. <laughs> and a couple years later, after that surgery, it got infected. Mm. So they had to go back in and redo her knee. And because of the debilitating of her joints, because of her RA, right. they had to do a reconstruction in her knee. But this time she had a sister <laughs> as a surgeon. Yes. And I tell you, her knee looks better than it did when she had her first surgery. Mm -hmm. The scar is not as noticeable. And then she had to have another surgery on her left knee. Mm -hmm. And was basically a replacement, not reconstruction, but replacement. And she had the sister again Same as surgery. a surgeon. Yep. And this particular knee looks better than her right knee did when she had the first surgery right. in California mm -hmm. by this Asian doctor. So the way I say it, I say this to say, I say that to say this. <laughs> I don't think it's a coincidence uh, that her knee looks better when she had a black surgeon, a sister that did the surgery on her knee because of the care that she received from this black doctor. Mm. So it's no coincidence that he had such a success rate because he cared, I mean, generally cared for his patients. Right. Not just doing it for the check, mm. you know, not just going through the motions just to get her in and out, but, he act, but she actually cared for her patient. Right. So Jesus is the ultimate healer. Yes. He anoints those with the gifts of healing. Mm -hmm. So my scripture is Matthew 10 and 1. Okay. Matthew 10 and 1. It says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. This brother, Williams, was anointed and appointed by God. Mm. to do healing on his children. Mm. 1893, Williams darlingly performed open heart surgery on a young black man, James Cornish. Now, this black man has received severe stab wounds in his chest. Mm. Despite having limited array of surgical equipment and medicine, Williams opened Cornish's chest cavity, operated on his heart without a patient dying from infection. Wow. Cornish recovered within 51 days and went to live on 50 more years. Wow. This is a testament mm. of Dr. Williams' sterilization and sanitizing techniques, which produced great surgical practices and procedures. He achieved great healthcare success in patients and extended their life because of his techniques and because he generally cared mm -hmm. for his patients. Now, nationally recognized, Williams in 1894 was appointed chief surgeon at Freeman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Mm. As a chief surgeon, Dr. Williams set high standards for doctors from all over the world who came to witness his operations. He also reorganized Freeman's Hospital, which had suffered years of neglect Mm. instituting and training school for black nurses, employing and 
multiracial staff, improving surgical procedures, developing ambulance services, and providing staff opportunities for numerous black physicians. Although he recognized that the value of racial integration in the medicine field, Williams in 1895 co-found National Medical Association because black medical practitioners were denied mm. admission in all white American Medical Association. In 1898, Williams left Freedman's Hospital, married Alice Johnson, and moved with her to Chicago, where he returned to Providence Hospital. Wow. Among the numerous honors and awards bestowed on Williams, perhaps the most groundbreaking was his becoming, in 1913, the first Black member of the exclusive American College of Surgeons. Mm. Later, he joined Sigma Pi Phi fraternity. That's our uncle's fraternity. Sci-fi. Sci-fi. Oh, the right. first Greek letter organization for African Americans. Mm -hmm. A year after settling in Chicago, Williams became afflicted with, with Meharry Medical College. I'm sorry, affiliated with Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. For the next two decades, he was a visiting clinical surgeon. Hmm. He was also now invited to work at larger hospitals, including Cook County Hospital and at St. Luke's Hospital on Chicago's South Side from 1907 to 1926. In 1926, Williams retired from St. Luke's after suffering a debilitating stroke. Hmm. He lived out his retirement years in idle Idlewild, Michigan, which is an all-Black resort community until his death on August the 4th, 1931. Mm. He was 75 at the time of his death. Mm. Though the historical Providence Hospital was forced to close in 1887 due to financial difficulties, it reopened in 1993 as part of Cook County Hospital Systems mm. to provide services to residents of Chicago Southside. It is now known as Provident Hospital of Cook County. So thank God right. that Chicago, no South Side is predominantly black. Mm -hmm. Thank God that Chicago preserved this black historical first, which is the first black medical hospital. That is outstanding. We've all heard of Daniel mm -hmm. Hale. That's the main name I remember. <laughs> Williams, <laughs> right. Uh, right. phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. has paved the way for paved so many way. other doctors, but That's does it. he get credit for it? Right. Absolutely right. not. Mm -hmm. So we've reached the end of our time uh -huh. here today. And normally we try to keep it well within right. our right. one hour limit. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will go ahead and conclude on today okay. Okay. with our scripture. We okay. have another bad sister, but maybe we'll bring her up, bring her up. Yeah. for uh Women's History Month or something, but stay right, tuned. Right. We've stay got tuned. some more Black history to, yeah, yeah. to uh, offer to you and to present mm -hmm. uh, and maybe to just enlighten you because a lot of this we were not aware of. Right, so right, right. we are learning. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we learn every day, right? Every day. Anybody that says they've arrived and know it all, I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> There's still so much more to learn. So That's we hope right. that you've enjoyed uh, this episode mm -hmm. and uh, Without further ado, I believe you have the closing yeah, scripture. Yeah, the scripture is right. coming from Isaiah 53, yes. 4 to 5. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 53, 4 to 5. And it says, surely he has borne our griefs yes. and carried our sorrows. Mm. Yet we did esteem him stricken, mm -hmm. smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Thank you, Lord. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace are upon him, and with his stripes, yes, we are healed. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Thank yes. you for joining us. Thank you. We appreciate you. We love you. We'll see you next week, and we continue on with Black History Tributes. God bless you. God bless you. you.